chapter ten of abigail adams and her times by laura elizabeth howe richards the sleepervox recording is in the public domain the court of st james not yet abigail the treaty of peace was signed on the twenty first of january seventeen eighty three but congress refused to john adams the leisure he had so amply earned and so ardently desired a treaty of commerce must be established between great britain and the united states and he with benjamin franklin and john jay must make it the faithful patriot accepted the new charge without hesitation but this time his body rebelled he fell dangerously ill of a fever brought on by anxiety and overwork for some days his life hung in the balance but he could not die then his work was not done barely recovered while still weak and suffering he hastened to london to take up the new task this accomplished another awaited him orders came for him to go at once to holland to obtain a loan for the new republic this he felt might well be the last straw for him yet he did not falter it was winter my health was very delicate a journey and voyage to holland at that season would very probably put an end to my labours i scarcely saw a possibility of surviving it nevertheless no man knows what he can bear till he tries a few moments reflection determined me for although i had little hope of getting the money having experienced so many difficulties before yet making the attempt and doing all in my power would discharge my own conscience and ought to satisfy my responsibility to the public here follows a detailed account of the trip which i exercise much self-control not to quote he adds i had ridden on horseback often to congress over roads and across ferries of which the present generation have no idea and once in seventeen seventy seven in the dead of winter from braintree to baltimore five hundred miles upon a trotting horse as dean swift boasted that he had done or could do i had been three days in the gulf stream in seventeen seventy eight in a furious hurricane and a storm of thunder and lightning which struck down our men upon deck and cracked our mainmast which the oldest officers and stoutest seamen stood aghast at their last prayers dreading every moment that a butt would start and all perish i had crossed the atlantic in seventeen seventy nine in a leaky ship with perhaps four hundred men on board who were scarcely able with two large pumps going all the twenty-four hours to keep water from filling the hold in hourly danger for twenty days together of foundering at sea i had passed the mountains in spain in the winter among ice and snow partly on mule-back and partly on foot yet i never suffered so much in any of these situations as in that jaunt from bath to amsterdam in january seventeen eighty four nor did any of those adventures ever do such lasting injuries to my health i never got over it till my return home in seventeen eighty eight still the tasks multiplied still the hills of difficulty rose before the devoted statesman finally in the summer of seventeen eighty four seeing his return home indefinitely postponed he dismissed his anxieties and summoned his faithful portia to his side she sailed on the twentieth of june on the ship active it was her first voyage and she did not enjoy it there are no more letters to her dearest friend the faithful pair were not to be separated again for any length of time but she writes a little every day to her sister mrs cranch and does full justice to the discomforts of life in a small sailing vessel of this i am very sure that no lady would ever wish a second time to try the sea were the objects of her pursuit within the reach of a land journey i have had frequent occasion since i came on board to recollect an observation of my best friends that no being in nature was so disagreeable as a lady at sea and this recollection has in a great measure reconciled me to the thought of being at sea without him for one would not wish my dear sister to be thought of in that light by those to whom we would wish to appear in our best array the decency and decorum of the most delicate female must in some measure yield to the necessities of nature and if you have no female capable of rendering you the least assistance you will feel grateful to any one who will feel for you and relieve or compassionate your sufferings 
she was woefully seasick at first poor lady after a time she felt better and writes the ship has become gradually less irksome to me if our cook was but tolerably clean i could relish my food but he is a great dirty lazy negro with no more knowledge of cookery than a savage nor any kind of order in the distribution of his dishes but on they come higgledy-piggledy with a leg of pork all bristly a quarter of an hour after a pudding or perhaps a pair of roast fowls first of all and then will follow one by one a piece of beef and when dinner is nearly completed a plate of potatoes such a fellow is a real imposition upon the passengers but gentlemen know but little about the matter and if they can get enough to eat five times a day all goes well we ladies have not eaten upon our whole passage more than just enough to satisfy nature or keep body and soul together her first impression of england was more exciting than agreeable driving to london in a post-chaise from chatham we proceeded on our way as fast as possible wishing to pass blackheath before dark upon this road a gentleman alone in a chaise passed us and very soon a coach before us stopped and there was a hue and cry a robbery a robbery the man in the chaise was the person robbed and this in open day with carriages constantly passing we were not a little alarmed and every one was concealing his money every place we passed and every post chaise we met was crying out a robbery where the thing is so common i was surprised to see such an alarm the robber was pursued and taken in about two miles and we saw the poor wretch ghastly and horrible brought along on foot his horse ridden by a person who took him and also had his pistol he looked like a youth of twenty only attempting to lift his hat and looked despair you can form some idea of my feelings when they told him ay you have but a short time the assize sits next month and then my lad you swing though every robber may deserve death yet to exult over the wretched is what our country is not accustomed to long may it be free from such villainies and long may it preserve a commiseration for the wretched at last she found herself in london at osborne's new family hotel adelphi where rooms had been engaged for her mr adams was at the hague detained by public business portia must be patient as she might here we have she writes a handsome drawing-room genteelly furnished and a large lodging-room we are furnished with a cook chambermaid waiter etc for three guineas a week but in this is not included a mouthful of victuals or drink all of which is to be paid for separately there was now little leisure for writing for callers came thick and fast mr this mrs that doctor the other all thronged to pay their respects many of these were former friends and neighbours of the tory persuasion living in more or less willing exile i hardly know how to think of myself out of my own country i see so many americans about me she knows that her sister will desire news of the fashions i am not a little surprised to find dress unless upon public occasion so little regarded here the gentlemen are very plainly dressed and the ladies much less so than with us tis true you must put a hoop on and have your hair dressed but a common straw hat no cap with only a ribbon upon the crown is thought sufficient to go into company muslins are much in taste no silks but lute-strings worn but send not to london for any article you want you may purchase anything you can name much lower in boston our country alas our country they are extravagant to astonishment in entertainments compared with what mr smith and mr storer tell me of this you will not find at a gentleman's table more than two dishes of meat though invited several days beforehand at my lodgings i am as quiet as at any place in boston nor do i feel as if it could be any other place than boston dr clark visits us every day says he cannot feel at home anywhere else declares he has not seen a handsome woman since he came into the city that every old woman looks like mrs h and every young one like like the d l they paint here nearly as much as in france but with more art the head-dress disfigures them in the eyes of an american i have seen many ladies but not one elegant one since i came there is not to me that neatness in their appearance which you see in our ladies 
the american ladies are much admired here by the gentlemen i am told and in truth i wonder not at it oh my country my country preserve preserve the little purity and simplicity of manners you yet possess believe me they are jewels of inestimable value the softness peculiarly characteristic of our sex and which is so pleasing to the gentleman is wholly laid aside here for the masculine attire and manners of amazonians a few days later she describes one of the numerous dinners to which she was invited after we had dined which was in company with five american gentlemen we retired to the drawing-room and there i talked off the lady's reserve and she appeared agreeable her dress pleased me and answered to the universal neatness of the apartments furniture and entertainment it was a delicate blue and white copper-plate calico with a blue lute-string skirt flounced a muslin apron and handkerchief which are much more worn than gauze her hair a fine black dressed without powder with a fashionable cap and straw ribbons upon her head and breast with a green morocco slipper our dinner consisted of fried fish of a small kind a boiled ham a fillet of veal a pair of roast ducks an almond pudding currants and gooseberries which in this country are very fine painted muslin is much worn here a straw hat with a deep crown lined and a white green or any colored ribbon you choose the visitors came and went and mrs adams received them graciously and returned their visits and wrote to sisters and nieces but all the time her heart was in holland and she found the days long and weary that kept her friend from her at last at long long last the great day came on august seventh mr adams writes in his diary arrived at the adelphi buildings london and met my wife and daughter after a separation of four years and a half indeed after a separation of ten years excepting a few visits set off the next day for paris september seventeen eighty four found the adamses settled at otoy four miles from paris in much contentment after the long years of separation mrs adams writes to her sister mrs cranch the house is much larger than we have need of upon occasion forty beds may be made in it i fancy it must be very cold in winter there are few houses with the privilege which this enjoys that of having the saloon as it is called the apartment where we receive company upon the first floor this room is very elegant and about a third larger than general warren's hall but with an expense of thirty thousand livres in looking-glasses there is no table in the house better than an oak board nor a carpet belonging to the house the floors i abhor made of red tiles in the shape of mrs quincey's floor-cloth tiles these floors will by no means bear water so that the method of cleaning them is to have them waxed and then a man-servant with foot-brushes drives round your room dancing here and there like a merry andrew this is calculated to take from your foot every atom of dirt and you leave the room in a few minutes as he found it the dining-rooms of which you make no other use are laid with small stones like the red tiles for shape and size the servants apartments are generally upon the first floor and the stairs which you commonly have to ascend to get into the family apartments are so dirty that i have been obliged to hold up my clothes as though i was passing through a cow-yard she finds living in paris very expensive moreover some of the expenses seem to her republican mind unreasonable there is now a court mourning and every foreign minister with his family must go into mourning for a prince of eight years old whose father is an ally to the king of france this mourning is ordered by the court and is to be worn for eleven days only poor mr jefferson had to hie away for a tailor to get a whole black silk suit made up in two days and at the end of eleven days should another death happen he will be obliged to have a new suit of mourning of cloth because that is the season when silk must be left off we may groan and scold but these are expenses which cannot be avoided for fashion is the deity every one worships in this country and from the highest to the lowest you must submit in a letter to her niece betsy cranch she describes the house in greater detail and dwells with delight on the beauty of the garden but paris you must not ask me how i like it because i am going to tell you of the pretty little apartment next to this in which i am writing 
why my dear you cannot turn yourself in it without being multiplied twenty times now that i do not like for being rather clumsy and by no means an elegant figure i hate to have it so often repeated to me the room is about ten or twelve feet large is eight cornered and panelled with looking-glasses a red and white india patch with pretty borders encompasses it low-back stuffed chairs with garlands of flowers encircling them adorn this little chamber festoons of flowers are round all the glasses a lustre hangs from the ceiling adorned with flowers a beautiful sofa is placed in a kind of alcove with pillows and cushions in abundance the use of which i have not yet investigated in the top of this alcove over the sofa in the ceiling is another glass here is a beautiful chimney-piece with an elegant painting of rural life in a country farmhouse lads and lasses jovial and happy this little apartment opens into your cousin's bedchamber it has a most pleasing view of the garden and it is that view which always brings my dear betsy to my mind and makes me long for her to enjoy the delights of it with me mrs adams certainly did not like paris they tell me i am no judge for that i have not seen it yet one thing i know and that is that i have smelt it it is the very dirtiest place i ever saw boston cannot boast so elegant public buildings but in every other respect it is as much superior in my eyes to paris as london is to boston it is hard to choose among these sprightly letters so full of colour and gaiety here is an account of the marquise de lafayette written to mrs cranch the marquise met me at the door and with the freedom of an old acquaintance and the rapture peculiar to the ladies of this nation caught me by the hand and gave me a salute upon each cheek most heartily rejoiced to see me you would have supposed i had been some long absent friend whom she dearly loved she presented me to her mother and sister who were present with her all sitting together in her bedroom quite en famille. one of the ladies was knitting the marquise herself was in a chintz gown she is a middle-sized lady sprightly and agreeable and professes herself strongly attached to americans she supports an amiable character is fond of her children and very attentive to them which is not the general character of ladies of high rank in europe in a few days she returned my visit upon which we sent her a card of invitation to dine she came we had a large company there is not a lady in our country who would have gone abroad to dine so little dressed and one of our fine american ladies who sat by me whispered to me good heavens how awfully she is dressed i could not forbear returning the whisper which i most sincerely despised by replying that the lady's rank sets her above the little formalities of dress she had on a brown florence gown and petticoat which is the only silk excepting satins which are worn here in winter a plain double gauze handkerchief a pretty cap with a white ribbon in it and looked very neat the rouge tis true was not so artfully laid on as upon the faces of the american ladies who were present whilst they were glittering with diamonds watch-chains girdle-buckles etc the marquise was nowise ruffled by her own different appearance a really well-bred french lady has the most ease in her manners that you can possibly conceive of it is studied by them as an art and they render it nature it requires some time you know before any fashion quite new becomes familiar to us the dress of the french ladies has the most taste and variety in it of any i have yet seen but these are topics i must reserve to amuse my young acquaintance with i have seen none however who carry the extravagance of dress to such a height as the americans who are here some of whom i have reason to think live at an expense double what is allowed to the american ministers they must however abide the consequences the months spent in france proved interesting enough when in may seventeen eighty five mr adams was appointed united states minister plenipotentiary to great britain his wife had some things to regret though more to anticipate delightful and blooming garden how much i shall regret your loss it will not be easy to find in the midst of a city so charming a scene but paris was soon forgotten in the excitement of the london season london was very full this may and june 
the adamses had hard work to find a house but were finally established in lodgings at the moderate price of a guinea per day for two rooms and two chambers at the bath hotel westminster piccadilly the first great event was the presentation to royalty first of mr adams in private then of the family in public mrs adams notes rather ruefully that one is obliged here to attend the circles of the queen which are held in summer once a fortnight but once a week the rest of the year and what renders it exceedingly expensive is that you cannot go twice the same season in the same dress and a court dress you cannot make use of anywhere else this was hard indeed for people of moderate means and simple tastes but as usual mrs adams was mistress of the emergency i directed my mantua maker to let my dress be elegant but plain as i could possibly appear with decency accordingly it is white lute-string covered and full trimmed with white crape festooned with lilac ribbon and mock point lace over a hoop of enormous extent there is only a narrow train of about three yards in length to the gown waist which is put into a ribbon upon the left side the queen only having her train borne ruffle cuffs for married ladies treble lace ruffles a very dress cap with long lace lappets two white plumes and a blonde lace handkerchief this is my rigging i should have mentioned two pearl pins in my hair earrings and necklace of the same kind on the day of the festivities she writes my head is dressed for st james and in my opinion looks very tasty whilst my daughter's is undergoing the same operation i set myself down composedly to write you a few lines well methinks i hear betsy and lucy say what is cousin's dress white my dear girls like your aunt's only differently trimmed and ornamented her train being wholly of white crape and trimmed with white ribbon the petticoat which is the most showy part of the dress covered and drawn up in what are called festoons with light wreaths of beautiful flowers the sleeves white crape drawn over the silk with a row of lace round the sleeve near the shoulder another halfway down the arm and a third upon the top of the ruffle a little flower stuck between a kind of hat cap with three large feathers and a bunch of flowers a wreath of flowers upon the hair thus equipped we go in our own carriage and mr adams and colonel smith in his but i must quit my pen to put myself in order for the ceremony which begins at two o'clock when i return i will relate to you my reception but do not let it circulate as there may be persons eager to catch at everything and as much given to misrepresentation as here i would gladly be excused the ceremony the next day she thus continues congratulate me my dear sister it is over i was too much fatigued to write a line last evening at two o'clock we went to the circle which is in the drawing-room of the queen we passed through several apartments lined as usual with spectators upon these occasions we were placed in a circle round the drawing-room which was very full i believe two hundred persons present only think of the task the royal family have to go round to every person and find small talk enough to speak to all of them though they very prudently speak in a whisper so that only the person who stands next to you can hear what is said the king enters the room and goes round to the right the queen and princesses to the left the lord-in-waiting presents you to the king and the lady-in-waiting does the same to her majesty the king is a personable man but my dear sister he has a certain countenance which you and i have often remarked a red face and white eyebrows the queen has a similar countenance and the numerous royal family confirm the observation persons are not placed according to their rank in the drawing-room but promiscuously and when the king comes in he takes persons as they stand when he came to me lord onslow said mrs adams upon which i drew off my right-hand glove and his majesty saluted my left cheek then asked me if i had taken a walk to-day i could have told his majesty that i had been all the morning preparing to wait upon him but i replied no sire why don't you love walking says he i answered that i was rather indolent in that respect he then bowed and passed on it was more than two hours after this before it came to my turn to be presented to the queen the circle was so large and the company were four hours standing 
the queen was evidently embarrassed when i was presented to her i had disagreeable feelings too she however said mrs adams have you got into your house pray how do you like the situation of it while the princess royal looked compassionate and asked me if i was not much fatigued and observed that it was a very full drawing-room her sister who came next princess augusta after having asked your niece if she was ever in england before and her answering yes inquired of me how long ago and supposed it was when she was very young all this was said with much affability and the ease and freedom of old acquaintance the manner in which they make their tour round the room is first the queen the lady-in-waiting behind her holding up her train next to her the princess royal after her princess augusta and their lady-in-waiting behind them they are pretty rather than beautiful well shaped with fair complexions and a tincture of the king's countenance the two sisters look much alike they were both dressed in black and silver silk with a silver netting upon the coat and their heads full of diamond pins the queen was in purple and silver she is not well shaped nor handsome as to the ladies of the court rank and title may compensate for want of personal charms but they are in general very plain ill-shaped and ugly but don't tell anybody that i say so mrs adams did not enjoy court occasions i know she says to sister mary i am looked down upon with a sovereign pride and the smile of royalty is bestowed as a mighty boon as such however i cannot receive it i know it is due to my country and i consider myself as complimenting the power before which i appear as much as i am complimented by being noticed by it with these ideas you may be sure my countenance will never wear that suppliant appearance which begs for notice consequently i never expect to be a court favourite nor would i ever again set my foot there if the etiquette of my country did not require it but whilst i am in a public character i must submit to the penalty for such i shall ever esteem it in the same letter she describes one of the queen's drawing-rooms the company were very brilliant and her majesty was stiff with diamonds the three eldest princesses and the prince of wales were present his highness looked much better than when i saw him before he is a stout well-made man and would look very well if he had not sacrificed so much to bacchus the princess elizabeth i never saw before she is about fifteen a short clumsy miss and would not be thought handsome if she was not a princess the whole family have one complexion and all are inclined to be corpulent i should know them in any part of the world notwithstanding the english boast so much of their beauties i do not think they have really so much of it as you will find amongst the same proportion of people in america mrs siddons was then in her glory and abigail did not fail to see her and to describe her to the sisterhood at home this time it is sister shaw who hears how the first piece i saw her in was shakespeare's othello she was interesting beyond any actress i had ever seen but i lost much of the pleasure of the play from the sooty appearance of the moor perhaps it may be early prejudice but i could not separate the african colour from the man nor prevent that disgust and horror which filled my mind every time i saw him touch the gentle desdemona nor did i wonder that brabancho thought some love potion or some witchcraft had been practised to make his daughter fall in love with what she scarcely dared look upon i have been more pleased with her since in several other characters particularly in matilda in the carmelite a play which i send you for your amusement much of shakespeare's language is so uncouth that it sounds very harsh he has beauties which are not equalled but i should suppose they might be rendered much more agreeable for the stage by alterations i saw mrs siddons a few evenings ago in macbeth a play you recollect full of horror she supported her part with great propriety but she is too great to be put in so detestable a character you must make as much interest here to get a box when she plays as to get a place at court and they are usually obtained in the same way it would be very difficult to find the thing in this country which money will not purchase provided you can bribe high enough what adds much to the merit of mrs siddons is her virtuous character slander itself never having slurred it she is married to a man who bears a good character 
but his name and importance are wholly swallowed up in her fame she is the mother of five children but from her looks she would not imagine her more than twenty-five years old she is happy in having a brother who is one of the best tragic actors upon the stage and always plays the capital parts with her so that both her husband and the virtuous part of the audience can see them in the tenderest scenes without once fearing for their reputation to thomas jefferson she wrote on june sixth seventeen eighty five i went last week to hear the music handel's in westminster the messiah was performed it was sublime beyond description i most sincerely wished for your presence as your favourite passion would have received the highest gratification i should have sometimes fancied myself amongst a higher order of beings if it had not been for a very troublesome female who was unfortunately seated behind me and whose volubility not all the powers of music could still mrs adams was certainly an admirable correspondent the long years of separation from her dearest friend had taught her how her letters were longed for by those at home and she writes without stint to sisters nieces and friends here are two letters to betsy and lucy cranch describing the gaieties of london i believe i once promised to give you an account of that kind of visiting called a lady's rout there are two kinds one where a lady sets apart a particular day in the week to see company these are held only five months in the year it being quite out of fashion to be seen in london during the summer when a lady returns from the country she goes round and leaves a card with all her acquaintances and then sends them an invitation to attend her routes during the season the other kind is where a lady sends to you for certain evenings and the cards are always addressed in her own name both to gentlemen and ladies the rooms are all set open and card tables set in each room the lady of the house receiving her company at the door of the drawing-room where a set number of courtesies are given and received with as much order as is necessary for a soldier who goes through the different evolutions of his exercise the visitor then proceeds into the room without appearing to notice any other person and takes her seat at the card-table nor can the muse her aid impart unskilled in all the terms of art nor in harmonious numbers put the deal the shuffle and the cut go tom and light the ladies up it must be one before we sup at these parties it is usual for each lady to play a rubber as it is termed when you must lose or win a few guineas to give each a fair chance the lady then rises and gives her seat to another set it is no unusual thing to have your room so crowded that not more than half the company can sit at once yet this is called society and polite life they treat their company with coffee tea lemonade orget and cake i know of but one agreeable circumstance attending these parties which is that you may go away when you please without disturbing anybody i was early in the winter invited to madame de pinto's the portuguese minister's i went accordingly there were about two hundred persons present i knew not a single lady but by sight having met them at court and it is an established rule that though you were to meet as often as three nights in the week never to speak together or know each other unless particularly introduced i was however at no loss for conversation madame de pinto being very polite and the foreign ministers being the most of them present who had dined with us and to whom i had been early introduced it being sunday evening i declined playing cards indeed i always get excused when i can and heavens forbid i should catch the manner living as they rise at eight o'clock we returned home in order to dress ourselves for the ball at the french ambassador's to which we had received an invitation a fortnight before he has been absent ever since our arrival here till three weeks ago he has a levy every sunday evening at which there are usually several hundred persons the hotel de france is beautifully situated fronting st james park one end of the house standing upon hyde park it is a most superb building about half past nine we went and found some company collected many very brilliant ladies of the first distinction were present the dancing commenced about ten and the room soon filled the room which he had built for this purpose is large enough for five or six hundred persons it is most elegantly decorated hung with a gold tissue ornamented with twelve brilliant cut lustres each contained twenty-four candles 
at one end there are two large arches these were adorned with wreaths and bunches of artificial flowers upon the walls in the alcoves were cornucopiae loaded with oranges sweetmeats etc coffee tea lemonade orget etc were taken here by every person who chose to go for them there were covered seats all round the room for those who did not choose to dance in the other rooms card tables and a large faro table were set this is a new kind of game which is much practised here many of the company who did not dance retired here to amuse themselves this was betsy's letter lucy was to hear about the dresses to amuse you then my dear niece i will give you an account of the dress of the ladies at the ball of the comte d'adamar as your cousin tells me that she some time ago gave you a history of the birthday and ball at court this may serve as a counterpart though should i attempt to compare the apartments st james would fall as much short of the french ambassadors as the court of his britannic majesty does of the splendour and magnificence of that of his most christian majesty i am sure i never saw an assembly room in america which did not exceed that at st james in point of elegance and decoration and as to its fair visitors not all their blaze of diamonds set off with parisian rouge can match the blooming health the sparkling eye and modest deportment of the dear girls of my native land as to the dancing the space they had to move in gave them no opportunity to display the grace of a minuet and the full dress of long court trains and enormous hoops you well know were not favourable for country dances so that i saw them at every disadvantage not so the other evening they were much more properly clad silk waists gauze or white or painted tiffany coats decorated with ribbon beads or flowers as fancy directed were chiefly worn by the young ladies hats turned up at the sides with diamond loops and buttons of steel large bows of ribbons and wreaths of flowers displayed themselves to much advantage upon the heads of some of the prettiest girls england can boast the light from the lustres is more favourable to beauty than daylight and the colour acquired by dancing more becoming than rouge as fancy dresses are more favourable to youth than the formality of a uniform there was as great a variety of pretty dresses borrowed wholly from france as i have ever seen and amongst the rest some with sapphire blue satin waists spangled with silver and laced down the back and seams with silver stripes white satin petticoats trimmed with black and blue velvet ribbon an odd kind of head-dress which they term the helmet of minerva i did not observe the bird of wisdom however nor do i know whether those who wore the dress had suitable pretensions to it and pray say you how were my aunt and cousin dressed if it will gratify you to know you shall hear your aunt then wore a full-dress court cap without the lappets in which was a wreath of white flowers and blue sheafs two black and blue flat feathers which cost her half a guinea apiece but that you need not tell of three pearl pins bought for court and a pair of pearl earrings the cost of them no matter what no less than diamonds however a sapphire blue demi saison with a satin stripe sack and petticoat trimmed with a broad black lace crepe flounce etc leaves made of blue ribbon and trimmed with white floss wreaths of black velvet ribbon spotted with steel beads which are much in fashion and brought to such perfection as to resemble diamonds white ribbon also in the van dyck style made up the trimming which looked very elegant a full dress handkerchief and a bouquet of roses full gay i think for my aunt that is true lucy but nobody is old in europe i was seated next the duchess of bedford who had a scarlet satin sack and coat with a cushion full of diamonds for hair she has none and is but seventy-six neither well now for your cousin a small white leghorn hat bound up with pink satin ribbon a steel buckle and band which turned up at the side and can find a large pink bow large bow of the same kind of ribbon behind a wreath of full-blown roses round the crown and another band of buds and roses with inside the hat which being placed at the back of the hair brought the roses to the edge you see it clearly one red and black feather with two white ones completed the head-dress a gown and coat of chambery gauze with a red satin stripe over a pink waist and coat flounced with crape 
trimmed with broad point and pink ribbon wreaths of roses across the coat gauze sleeves and ruffles mrs adams was very fond of her nieces and they must have their share of london finery in july seventeen eighty six she writes to my dear girls i bought me a blue sarsnet coat not long since after making it up i found it was hardly wide enough to wear over a straw coat but i thought it was no matter i could send it to one of my nieces when i went to put it up i thought i wished i had another it is easily got said i ned bring the carriage to the door and drive me to thornton's the petticoat shop here madam is a very nice pink coat made too of the whitest sarsnet well put it up so back i drove and now my dear girls there is a coat for each of you settle between yourselves which shall have the blue and which the pink pay no regard to the direction only when you put them on remember your aunt wishes they were better for your sakes sarsnet was in those days a fine soft silk the word being probably derived from saracen it is pleasant to fancy the delight of the nieces when the box from london arrived how they shook out the shining folds and tried the coats on before the glass and cried dear kind aunt abby though london claimed most of their time there were pleasant jaunts now and then for the adamses to this or that famous place they went to windsor to bath which abigail disliked heartily to portsmouth mr adams diary gives glimpses of some of these excursions april seventeen eighty six edgehill and worcester were curious and interesting to us as scenes where freemen had fought for their rights the people in the neighbourhood appeared so ignorant and careless at worcester that i was provoked and asked and do englishmen so soon forget the ground where liberty was fought for tell your neighbours and your children that this is holy ground much holier than that on which your churches stand all england should come in pilgrimage to this hill once a year this animated them and they seemed much pleased with it perhaps their awkwardness before might arise from their uncertainty of our sentiments concerning the civil wars a trip like this must have been a great refreshment to mrs adams she did not like london she tells her friend mrs warren i have resided in this country nearly two years and in that time i have made some few acquaintances whom i esteem and shall leave with regret but the customs and manners of a metropolis are unfriendly to that social intercourse which i have ever been accustomed to amusement and diversion may always be purchased at the theatres and places of public resort so that little pains are taken to cultivate that benevolence and interchange of kindness which sweetens life in lieu of which mere visits of form are substituted to keep up the union not only the wrinkled brow of age is grasping at the card-table and even tricking with mean avarice but the virgin bloom of innocence and beauty is withered at the same vigils i do not think i should draw a false picture of the nobility and gentry of this metropolis if i were to assert that money and pleasure are the sole objects of their ardent pursuit public virtue and indeed all virtue is exposed to sale and as to principle where is it to be found either in the present administration or opposition luxury dissipation and vice have a natural tendency to extirpate every generous principle and leave the heart susceptible of the most malignant vices i think she longed for home throughout the three years of her stay in london it was not her own place she met many famous people and was glad to meet them but their ways were not her ways besides this her reception at court as well as her husband's had been as cold as policy and bare civility would allow how could it be otherwise how could george the third honest creature that he was pretend to be glad to see the minister of his own lost dominion it was perhaps too much to expect of him and queen charlotte was of no more heroic mould than he of no more tact or innate courtesy and behaved accordingly abigail adams was too proud to allude to this at the time there is no hint of it in the letters from london it was not till long after this that in a letter to her daughter she shows something of the bitterness that still remained in her heart it was when the french revolution seemed to threaten disaster to the throne of england humiliation for charlotte she says is no sorrow for me 
she richly deserves her full portion for the contempt and scorn which she took pains to discover those must have been grave affronts indeed that made so deep and abiding an impression on a heart so good and kind the stay in london brought her two great joys the happy marriage of her daughter abigail to colonel w s smith the young secretary of the american legation and the birth of her first grandson but when all was said it was a glad day that brought mr adams decision to petition congress for leave to return home and a far gladder one for mrs adams when she set foot once more in may seventeen eighty eight on the shore of the country she so deeply loved End of chapter ten